Hi, Shay Given here. You're watching Irish Football Fan TV. Hello, uh, welcome back to Irish Football Fan TV. Today I'm here with none other than Eamon Zoid over on his breakaway in Ireland over the Christmas break. Thanks very much for coming on, Eamon. Much appreciated. No, well, delighted to be on. Back in uh, where it all began, eh? Brought for Rovers. Yeah, I was just walking around reminiscing. Um, geez, I haven't been here in years and years. But um, yeah, this is where it started under sevens, under eights. Um, I think That's when I started as well here, yeah. Yeah, I think. Uh, Joe Graham was my coach at the time, and um, I had some great times. Made some, Jesus, you know, lads I still hang around with. Um, played here eight, eight to fourteen, I believe. Yeah, so um, it's nice being back. The start of a wonderful career, I suppose. It was, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I really did. You know, at, at, at under eight, um, kind of you're still knocking around with friends, and I mean, I don't know how much kind of in terms of coaching you kind of pick pick up. But um, and I had a great time here from eight to fourteen, and then I went to um, St Joseph's um, Boys in Sally Noggin. Yeah. Um, again there for three four years. Um, was it from from Joey's you went to Bray? Was it? No. So St Joseph's, I it was a funny one. So I would have I left. They kind of <laughs> scouted me um, whilst I was playing with Bradford Rovers. Um, and um, the coach at the time, Nolo Driscoll of St. Joseph's, asked me to join there. So I went there 14, 15. But I remember my first couple of years with St. Joseph's, I was, um, I mean, I I probably started maybe 75% of the games, but I didn't start all the games. Um, but every year I was, um, every year I was there, I was top goal scorer. Um, and then I think under, I probably was a late developer, I think under... 16s was my kind of standout year. Um, I had a really good year, um, you know, and um, I think uh, I went on a couple of trials. Um, went to Everton, I went to Man City, I went to Newcastle, but I went to Arsenal um, a couple of times whilst um, whilst playing under 16s, and um, actually got offered a three-year three-year deal over there with Liam Brady, who was uh, looking after the academy yeah, at the yeah. time. And, that um, was before you went with Trap Town, wasn't it? Yeah, the before yeah. That. Um, and uh, and I mean, I was delighted. I was there four weeks in the summer. Just finished my under sixteen season. There four weeks in the summer, um, and I remember, you know, playing at the. I think I was what under sixteens, going under seventeens, but they put me um, with the under nineteen team in pre season over in Arsenal, and um, I remember playing with some excellent players. Uh, the game that stands out. I mean, we played a few games. Um, and I remember playing against Wimbledon at the time, and it was myself and David Bentley up front. There was um, Steve Sidwell, Rowan Ricketts, um, I mean Jerome Thomas. There was a lot of players that went on to to make. Yeah, they did all right. I mean Jerome Thomas went on to West Brom, Charlton, didn't he? He did, and then, yeah. Uh, they Bentley, then Spurs and Blackburn. Yeah, they all had decent careers. But um, I mean, I. I've, uh, I remember going over there and I felt really good at the time and I was playing well and then four weeks into it I was a little bit I don't know I was a little bit um, I think I was a little bit homesick if I'm being honest um, so I went in sat down with Liam Brady and um, he told me that they liked me and they wanted me um, to stay on for three years and he said look go home um, have a week at home pack your bags and then you know come over here and you're with us for the three years and uh I know the idea of going home for the week, packing my bags, and just going straight over to Arsenal, and that was it for for three years. Kind of, I don't know, it kind of scared me a little bit at the time. When I went back home, um, I sat down and, and talked to my mom, who would be my greatest advisor, and um, she said that, you know, she said, "Look, I mean, you're, I skipped fourth year, so I just finished fifth year." So she goes, "Look, you have one year left in St. Benilde's, um you know, uh, in, in Slorgan, um, I have one year left there." And she said, "Do you want to like finish your leaving cert?" And um, when she said that, I kind of, I don't know, I kind of clinged on to that that idea, going, "Oh, maybe you're right." I think deep down, I was a little bit scared at the thought of going over um, and leaving everything behind me for three years, um, and I probably wasn't ready. It's understandable, that a lot of players have done that as well, though. Yeah, you hear about a lot of players going over. I think sixteen is a young age. I mean, it really yeah. is. And you hear a lot of players going over and you know getting getting homesick. I I know numerous players that went over and came back after a year or after a few months. Um, I just think it's a tough ask to ask a 16 year old to leave everything behind them and, and go over and um, you know you are well looked after within those clubs and everything is there in front of you um, you know if you need anything uh, there's always someone there to ask but um, it's still it's tough being away from home I think and 
that's what I done. I stayed. Um, my mum actually rang Liam Brady herself, which was funny, and asked him if uh, if he would uh, consider just you know give me the contract, but let me stay in Ireland um, for the year, kind of going over um, and any breaks I had, yeah, you know, Halloween, Easter break, Christmas, yeah, yeah. Easter. Um, but he said, look, I mean, if anyone doesn't sign, we like him. But if he doesn't sign, we have a Brazilian or a French lad just ready to step in in his position. So um, I didn't, I didn't, um, didn't sign over there. And um, I don't think it was a bad decision. It must have um, been nice of someone of Liam Brady's like presence to to, to be acknowledging your talents. So. Yeah, it does. I think it gives you major confidence. And um, and I think I used that confidence because I stayed. Then the following year was under 17s and um, again with St Joseph's. And um, and individually, that was by far my best year. Um, I scored 53 goals, which I think was a record at the time. Um, throughout the season, um, with St Joseph's, we won the league. We won the uh, Leinster Cup we won the All-Ireland under 17 under 18 Cup and um, no I had a phenomenal year and um, at the end of the year uh, Leicester City were in a premiership um, coach at the time of Leicester City was Peter Taylor his assistant coach um, I can't remember his name but he physically which was impressive he came over to Ireland and watched me play um, I think it was one of the one of the finals I think it could have been the under 17 18 All-Ireland final but he was there in the stands and um, we played in Talca Park watching me and uh, after that he said look we would like to take you over to Leicester City and give you give you a three year deal um, and that's what we done, I went over and they put me straight into the reserve team, I was 17 years of age going straight into the reserve team um, of Leicester City which was fantastic um, at the time but that didn't last very long. Um, within three months Leicester City were bottom of the Premiership and Peter Taylor and the rest of the coaching staff got sacked and um, in came Mickey Adams oh, yeah. and Dave Bassett I think or Dave Bassett came in um, I can't remember his name um, but the two of them came in um, as coach and assistant coach and things just kind of went downhill from there um, you know I was I was still knocking away with the reserve teams and the under 18 team and under 19 team um, but uh, I remember I think within within a month or two of Vicky Adams coming in bear in mind I was only at the club five, six months Yeah. Um, Mickey Adams um, you know he, he'd obviously look after the first team training and when they wanted to make up play, uh, numbers for training they would call some of the junior pros in just to make up the numbers and I was obviously a junior pro at the time and he called me in and um just into training and they were playing I remember it was a cold day it was like like it is if it's today outside <laughs> it was a cold day so we were using the indoor facility and um, we were playing just five sides and um, small goals um, but behind the goal was a, a bench um, and you had to I don't, I don't think we were playing with goalkeepers I think you had to hit the bench to score and it was first goal on first first goal scored you know the the, the winners stay on yeah roll on roll off yeah, yeah. yeah next team comes on and um and I remember anyway playing and, and I hit the bench behind the goal and Mickey Adams was uh, was actually playing on the other team um, he fancied himself as a bit of a player I think he used to play um, yeah. but uh, he was getting involved with tra- in training and, and he was playing anyway in the other team when he hit the bench he was like ah, no goal, no goal and kind of just looked at him didn't say anything um, played on I hit the bench again and he looked at me and said no, he just said no goal, no goal and I mean I was young I probably should have just said nothing considering he was the coach but um, you know it was you know, young and a little bit hot-headed, I kind of you shouted can. and I said, what the, like, what, what you the, can curse if you yeah, want to like, what the fuck do you mean it was no goal? Obviously, I was screaming at him, going, what the fuck do you mean it was no goal? I hit the fucking bench, yeah. that's the second time. I was just frustrated, because I mean, you want to win, and you want to do well. Yeah. Um, and he looked at me, and didn't say anything. Um, and a few minutes later, their team went on and, you know, scored a goal or hit the bench behind the goal and um, kind of looked at me and said, that's how he scored a fucking goal and there was a bag of balls beside him. And he just started kicking them at me one by one, and he goes, "Get the fuck out of here!" And um, that was the last time I was uh, invited up to train with the first team, and things just weren't. I don't think. I don't think. You went sour after then after. Yeah, it really did. Um, the following year, you know, Leicester City had got prom- uh, relegated that that season from the Premiership, and uh, I went back um, for the summer holidays, and when I arrived back over for pre-season, uh, Mickey Adams called a meeting with all the first team first team lads and also the junior pros and he just said look all these are are, up, are in the transfer window or for sale if, if, if anyone comes up in for you you're free to go or if you know of any team that wants you 
go ahead, you're free to go. And um, again, I was what, 18 years of age, and I was like, what the fuck's going on here? And then he called us in um, one-on-one meetings, and he sat me down, and he said, look, you're probably not going to play here, so you know, if, if you want to go, you can go. And I was thinking, I have a two-year contract here. I, yeah. you, know, I was, you know, what's... I'm only 18 years of age, and I mean, it's a, it, was, it was a bit... bit um, was that I don't know, I just thought it was a bit much to kind of lay on a young lad. Um, but he said, look... He, I knew he didn't like me. He was like, "Look, you're you're not going to play here. So if you can find something great, if not, I mean, you know, you'll be here in preseason. So um, off we, off, off. I continued preseason. Off we went, and um, it's kind of old school back then. For the first month and a half of preseason, or the first month anyway, you just ran. You know, um, whether it was up a mountain or down by some lakes or whatever it was, you just ran. Um, there's no balls at all involved. So. Um, I remember the first month or so we were, you know, we were we were running around and, um, you know, Mickey Adams and the rest of the the trainers used to put up um, like used to put up lists on the board of like who's the fittest and who won the whatever we were doing that. I remember I made a conscious effort to to try and be near the top of these lists and um, I mean, you know, these were again these are first team, first teamers and junior pros, so um, you know, amongst the top of the list would have been Robbie Savage who was just a machine in terms of running he was um, a centre mid wasn't he he was a centre mid he just he could just run and run oh yeah well that's Robbie um, <laughs> yeah um, there was Muzzy as if there was um, geez, they had a I mean they really what was the ball centre back's name Elliot Elliot yeah yeah. yeah. he was uh, he was the captain of the team um, he wouldn't have been one of the fittest now um, <laughs> he didn't look like he no. would be no. but, um, good head of all though. no actually he was funny he used to always come into the, the younger lads dressing rooms and um, he used to go into the toilet and smoke a cigarette and then just run back up to the first team locker rooms then you know then fucking we'd have the, the academy coach or whoever come in and go who's smoking and everyone was obviously scared <laughs> to say it was <laughs> yeah, yeah, St. Clair there of course, yeah. or sorry Elias um, but anyway um, but I made I, I made a conscious effort to to try and get near these top of these yeah. fitness lists and, uh, and I did I was consistently number three or four out of a, a squad of 30 or 40 players Um and I, I was thinking, look, if I can, obviously, you know, prove myself, well, in any way possible, but definitely the fitness side of things. Then, you know, once we get the balls rolling, hopefully I'll do well there as well. But um, I remember the very first day we got the balls back involved in preseason. Um, we jumped on a bus from the training grounds, and we we got brought to the new Leicester City Stadium, which is obviously the current stadium yeah. now. So this the is the King Power now, isn't it? Yeah. It used to be the Walker Stadium. Yeah. yeah. So when I first joined, it was the, we had the Walker Stadium, and then they built this King Power Stadium. So I remember, anyway, we arrived. It's a brand spanking new stadium. This is the first year that they were going to be playing in it. And um, doing a warm-up um, on the pitch. Um, again, the junior pros were, were, were training with the first-teamers. And um, just as about... just. A, before we were about to start using the balls, Mickey Adams called about, I don't know, maybe six of us, six to eight of us, and said, right, you won't be playing with the balls today. And we're like, what? And he goes, right, what you are going to do is, see those um, steps on one far, one side of the pitch, all the way up to the top. I want you to jog all the way up to the top, decent speed, up the steps, back down, cross the pitch, up the steps to the other side of the pitch, and I want you to do that. We'll do it, maybe we'll... 10 minutes break 10 minutes break and I was thinking what is this like fucking crazy or what like what what are we doing this for Um, but it became evident that it was his way of trying to get you out of the club yeah he was trying to break it bullying you yeah he really was Um, and I'm telling you he was from my experience of him he was he was really not a nice man Um, he wasn't at all Um, I remember he seen him um, I think he signed for or he was coach of Sligo there not so long ago yeah I remember going, Jesus, I mean, what a slow with him. with um, him. Because he, he wasn't a nice guy. You know, maybe he matured a little bit, I don't know, but he wasn't a nice guy um, from, from when I dealt with him. And it was bullying. Um, and again, I'm 18 years of age, you know, obviously with the dream of, of, of breaking into a, to a team over there in England. Um, but, um, yeah, I quickly became disillusioned with football. Um, didn't know what to do. Um, really wasn't enjoying my time. At Leicester, at yeah, all. of course, you um, really wouldn't. But that sort of no, thing, though, and uh, through my St. Joseph's connection, they got Pat Devlin, who was coach of Bray Wonders at the time, to ring me. Um, you know, Pat obviously was coach of Bray Wonders, but he was also, I mean, he was an agent, he was an advisor, he 
he had um, I think he looked after Damien Duff and, and, and Shay Given um, but he rang me and he said look you know how are you feeling blah 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 he goes look if you want a way out I can find a way out and I said what are you talking about he goes look obviously I'm coach of Bray Wonders we can get you back playing um, playing football here for Bray we can get you back into college over here and I'll negotiate on your behalf some kind of payout um, obviously I had a two year contract still with Leicester yeah. so we can see what we can come to agreement with and um, and we'll get back you know get you back here and, and join football again and that at the time was for me was the best option well you um, needed something to get out of there ah uh, yeah, the yeah I couldn't have stayed there I really couldn't have um, you know so um, that's what we done and again I, I think it was the right decision I came back and, and started playing for Bray and um, I really really started enjoying my football again and um, at the time, Bray Wanderers had a lot of, um, a lot of kind of ex St Joseph's players that I grew up playing with. Um, so there was at least four or five of the young lads that that, that I played with in under sixteen, seventeen with St Joseph. So, um, you know, it was great. I just, it was just like playing with mates again, kicking yeah. the ball around the park and having fun. Um, and and that's playing with smile on your face. Really. Well, yeah, and, and you know, it wasn't it wasn't long before I, I broke into the Bray first team. Um, and Jason Byrne, I think he was injured one or two games and I got in and, and, and played up top and done well and everything went great it's, you know I started in college um, playing football um, and it wasn't long before um, I, I was going back on a couple of trials to England um, and Brian Kerr called me into the under 20s um, for the Irish uh, Youth World Cup um, so that was great yeah and then kicking on from, from Bray then you got a couple of moves then you kind of moved around yeah. the League of Ireland yeah I was with Bray for I'm going to say four four years four and a half years um, from there um, Paul Doolan signed me with Drogheda United Drogheda United at the time were building a, a team to win the league um, yeah. and that's what he done I, I signed for, for Drogheda in the summer of 2006 um, and in 2007 we won the the League of Ireland um, with Drogheda United um, 2008 um, 2008 we Drogheda ran into problems but I think the whole the whole League of Ireland where it was obviously the, it coincided with the recession here in Ireland yeah. um, a lot of the League of Ireland teams kind of ran into problems and Drogheda went into administration towards the the end of um, end of 2008 um, I would have been at the club two and a half years at that stage so um so yeah, they weren't in a position to, to offer anyone contracts. They went back from full time, back to part time, yeah. um, and we were all kind of at the end of two thousand eight left with um, with the idea of finding new clubs. Yeah, it seems to be a big a thing with the league. A lot of times, clubs do well for a while and then find themselves, you know, going yeah. back to part time. And players are like trying to have to find a club in the summer. Then it seems there to be a, a, an ongoing thing. Yeah, there was a there was a period there now, um, maybe a four year period or so. Um, where League of Ireland teams really struggled. Um, there was a lot of full-time teams dropping back to part-time. Um, there was issues, you know, you read in newspaper issues of players not getting paid and stuff like that. Um, but over the last four or five years, um, I definitely want to say over the last four years anyway, um, you know, definitely true good work from the PFAI, the Players' Union. Yeah. Um, I think League of Ireland teams have kind of finally... A lot more got stable, to, They've think. got to a position of of what they of they've kind of they've looked at the finances and now they know what they can and can't afford which is I guess all players wanted really you know they want to know that if I sign a contract in January for whatever amount of money it is that I'm going to get paid that for the duration of my contract um, you know that was the frustrating part I think from a player's point of view that you might you may sign for whatever money and obviously you know if a club offer you X amount of money you're going to say great yeah, I'll take it um, but then it wasn't sustainable and, and a few months into it or, or, or whatever um, clothes are struggling to pay it um, yeah and obviously people need that put food on the table and so on uh, yeah so you want to you need to plan if you have bills or mortgages or rent or whatever it is you need to know what you're what you're dealing with throughout the year um, but I, I do think now I do I, a lot of credit now I think the League of Ireland clubs have got their act together um, in terms of contracts I've, I even hear some clubs um not many, but a couple of clubs were offering fifty-two week of the year contracts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I've seen that too. And even two-year deals, um, you know. And this is new because um, you know, in, from two thousand and eight kind of onwards, it was you know teams went back to forty-week 
contracts and um, and one year contracts as well. So you'd hear a lot of the time you'd hear the better players, well all the players, but it was bizarre when you heard like the better players coming towards the end of their contract and whatever, November the first and having to sign on the dole or get a job in Tesco or whatever, summer or Christmas job. Um, you know, just to see them through until January. Yeah, and, and, and there's no I mean no issue with signing on the dole or, or, or working in Tesco or wherever. But these are meant to be professional soccer players. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and a professional football player should shouldn't have to do that I feel in in, in the off season, you know. But um but they were the times and, and people just had to deal with it. Yeah, and then you kicked on then from Drive was it the Derry then you went? No, from Drada, so two thousand eight is with Drada. And um I think two thousand eight was important, um, in terms of I guess I don't know, my where I am right now, I guess, and, and, and my kind of views on football. So from before two thousand eight, growing up from Broadford to Saint Joseph's, over to England, back to Ireland, wherever, I always thought, right, if you're gonna be a professional footballer and make a career of it, you have England and you have Scotland. If that doesn't work out, you have Ireland. And that's all I thought. I mean, that's all I knew. That's all I heard of. Yeah. I mean, you, you, I, I didn't hear of players going elsewhere. Um, but the end of 2008, when Jordan went into administration, I remember playing, um, there was four guys in the team. Um, Adam Hughes, F- Adam Hughes, Joe Kendricks, John Tamboris, and Faz Kadosevich. Um what we're we talking about we're looking at Joe from Ireland uh, John Tamboris Adam Hughes from Australia and um, Faz Kadosevich born in England from Bosnia um, but those four players decided to be proactive and what they done was they wrote up their CV um, and they sent it to numerous agents throughout throughout Europe and, and the world let's say from you know they'd um, they'd pick they'd, easy to Google and, and, and FIFA websites you found like FIFA registered agents you get their email um, and you might send I don't know 10 emails to, to whatever country and that's what they've done and they got a lot of feedback from it um, and they they got trials in um, in various countries um, they got to visit numerous places or they got offered trials um, from numerous places and um, what happened was two of them two of them went over to um, well firstly sorry one of them one of them asked me, would I be interested in going to Korea? Um, because there was an agent onto him. He was a midfielder. It was um, it was Adam Hughes, midfielder um, from Australia. An agent that got in touch with him and said, look, do you fancy going to Korea? Also, do you know a striker as well that may be interested? Because there's a team in Korea that are looking to, to, to sign you know, a couple of foreign players and maybe yourself and, and, and someone else would, would fit the bill. So... Um, Adam Hughes got in touch with me and I said serious Korea like um, I mean it never come into my mind um, you know the idea of playing in Korea but um, I went over for the week it was a week trial went over didn't work out but it was a good experience it kind of opened my eyes up to I mean they play football over there like right which I never even thought about I mean as silly as it sounds um, but you know they, they did um, then I came back and um, John Tamboris and Joe Kendricks got in touch with me and asked me would I be interested in going to Azerbaijan? Um, and I said, Azerbaijan? They said, yeah, um, we've just come back from a week's trial and they're looking for a striker. Um, it looks like, you know, we're going to sign. Um, two of them were defenders. Um, they said, it looks like we're going to sign and now they're looking for a striker. So they, through their agent, organised everything and I flew over to Azerbaijan. I was there for a week. Again, it didn't work out. Um, but again, it was a unique experience um, to see, you know, professional football over in Azerbaijan. I came back, um, this, this is all kind of happening at the end of 2008, I came back and um, I got a phone call from Liam Buckley who was coach of Sport and Fingal at the time and he asked me would I be interested in, in joining Sport and Fingal, Fingal and it was an interesting project because they were in the first division yeah. um, and I had, I mean I had, I just had, I had been in, with Drogheda United for the last two and a half years and we had, you know, we had won the league and we had won a couple of cups and we were like one of the, if not the best team in the Premier Division of, of Ireland, and um, and the idea of, I guess yeah, I'll, I'll be honest, down. the idea of dropping down to First Division was was really not appealing. Um, but I, I met up with Liam and he told me what was involved. Um, he 
telling me that the package on offer would include a Masters of my choice in DCU because Sport and Fingal had a connection with DCU and um, I'll be honest that kind of sold it for me I kind of looked back and I looked at my career and, and at the time you know it was 26 and I thought what am I doing here what, you know what direction is my life going um, obviously given the state of affairs with football in Ireland and teams going into administration and um, and, and full time teams dropping back to, to part time um, I just thought you know what this probably makes sense for me to I finished my degree in business in DIT um, and I'd always wanted to do a masters so that's you know that's all sold it to me and I signed I signed a two year contract with Sport and Fingal and um, I done a two I done a one year masters there uh, a masters in finance um, completed that in 2010 and that coincided with I guess the end of my contract with Sport and Fingal yeah um, <coughs> and uh, again. 2010 was a significant year and time for me because when I finished my masters, um, when I finished my masters in 2010, I kind of, I I was I was falling out of love with full time football. I really wasn't enjoying my time with um with Sport and Fingal. The first year was good, second year wasn't just wasn't going well. Um, I didn't I, I didn't get on with Liam Buckley. I mean we're not we don't don't really see eye to eye um, he was playing me out of position I mean anybody that knows me will know that I mean you know, obviously I played through the middle um, you know as a, as a number 9 yeah. um, and the idea of playing me out left or right a lot of lads will probably laugh at that but that's what Liam done he played me out left um, you know with, with Sport Fingal and I mean I'm, I'm not a left winger so I really wasn't enjoying my football and um, and I contemplated quitting full time football and uh, and and Getting a real job at him and joining the uh, the the world of finance, um, and uh, and that's that that was my thought process. I, I went on a couple of interviews, um, a couple of finance graduate positions, um, that were available. I saw online, um, and in and around that time, um, the Libya national team called um, called my father. My father is uh, he's you now he will be. Uh, to be born in Tunisia, but he was brought up in Libya, and my grandparents, his parents, are, are from Libya, so they came calling, and um, and that was the start, I think, of of my journey, um, of I guess playing further afield. Jumped on a plane over to Libya in September, first time, first time with oh, 2010, 2010, first time playing international football. Didn't know what to expect. Um, again, like I was jumping on this plane. With the thought process of before that, of, I, want to of, quit. I want to quit football. I, I'm fed up of football. Um, fed up of the stuff that's been going on in the League of Ireland with you know teams dropping from full time to part time and not being able to pay players and all this kind of stuff. Um, just constant uncertainty. Really. Yeah, and it just it was just I was and I wasn't enjoying my football. So um, you know I I I I, I went over to Libya and that was in my that was probably my thought process. Or in my mind before I went to Libya, but after one week of tasting international football, uh, of um, of arriving over on a plane uh, and being greeted by media and newspapers, cameras in your face, um, asking the questions and and seeing their kind of enthusiasm um, for <laughs> for you to to be representing Libya and training with the guys. Um, staying in the hotel with them for the week and, and um, then going to the game being greeted by 50, 60,000 people um, within the stadium I, I just I just felt this incredible buzz um, and I remember then on the plane back from Libya to Dublin just thinking well I mean I want to experience that again I mean yeah. I really do so when I jumped off the plane um, in Dublin I thought I want to continue playing full time football and I want to experience that. Um, so that's that was my mind then, and um, and that led me to um, eventually a few things happened in between. But eventually, I got a contract offer from uh, Stephen Kenny in Derry, and I went over there for the or up there for the year, and um, and probably had my best individual year. We had a good good year as a team. Um, I played with some. James McLean here. Um, I played with him, and uh, that was the year he broke out and went over to England. But um, I mean, in terms of goals, I had a phenomenal year. 
James assisted me with at least half of them, um, which he doesn't doesn't let me forget anytime soon. <laughs> um, but um, I know it was a great. I loved absolutely loved my time up in Derry. It was probably my favourite year. Of that um, was actually one of the questions I was going to ask you. So you basically answered it. It was my favourite year in terms of uh, a favourite year of playing football in the League of Ireland. Um, we didn't. We won the League Cup, um, but um, finished third. Maybe finished third in the league. Um, but it was great. I loved it. Um, I just yeah, the Brandywell is a special place to play, especially if. Especially I actually play a charity match on the field. Oh, it's great, especially if they like you. I mean, if 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 you go up and obviously you know I went up and I scored a few goals, and as soon as you kind of score a few goals and stuff like that, kind of they warm. You know, they were always welcoming when I first went up there, but obviously. With, when you're scoring goals they kind of warm up to you a little bit more yeah and really um, get behind you ah it's an absolute it's a proper proper football town or football city um it really is i mean they love their football up there they really do um and uh, and it was great i loved it um really i only have good things to say about Derry, but um that was a great year and i finished um i finished the uh, top goal scoring the league and um i won uh, players player of the year and um and from that um I got to move to to Iran. Yeah, but it's been to go from from wanting to to quit to to what all then became in front of you. But sorry, go on about uh, Iran. Yeah, no, no, I'll touch on that. You know, I mean, yeah, a year before that, I was ready to quit football. I mean, that's football is a strange game. You, you know, emotions and 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 stuff like that can can change quite easily. You know, one month you're one month you're great. Um, Everybody likes you, and you're the talk of the town, and flavor you know, you're, yeah, you're in the newspapers and stuff like that. And the next month, nobody wants you. Nobody wants to, to nobody wants to hear from you or anything like that. So um, it's, it's strange how football works, but um, yeah, and and I guess I don't know football as well. I feel over the years, it, it's about reinventing yourself. Um, you know, go from here to here, and then you might go back down. Whether it's an injury or something like that, you might get knocked down. You mightn't getting these contract offers and you need to kind of just work your balls off um, and keep believing in yourself and have that confidence to kind of get up um, in 2010 I was ready I was right here I, I mean I was rock bottom I couldn't have gotten lower I was ready to quit football um, and uh, and yeah luckily for me um, Stephen Kenny who is an absolute genius of a man I feel um, he really is um, he's had success know, everywhere he was probably bar over um, I don't think he was given a fair shot at Rovers and I think um, Rovers probably when he left and went to Dundalk I, I can imagine they kind of regretted that decision mm. um, no he's 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 a top 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 bloke um, and I have a lot of time for him and I wouldn't be where I am now if it wasn't for him um, he instilled this confidence and belief in me um, you know from as soon as I went up to Derry it wasn't you know we're going to get back we're going to get you back playing and you know You'll enjoy it, and you know, we'll, you know, you'll you'll do well. It was, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you back playing, and you're gonna be the top goal scoring in the league. You're gonna be the best striker in the league, um, and that's what he said from day one, and um, and that's what happened. So, um, so yeah, no, it was a great year, and um, and from there, um, from there, yeah, I went to Iran. On Facebook, reached out to me. Um, you know, I, I didn't initially. I think it was the beginning of December. 2011 he reached out to me obviously the season had finished at the end of October in, in Ireland um, and I hadn't signed for anyone yet I'd finished my contract in Derry and I was contemplating go, going up to Derry for another year um, the reason why I hadn't signed that contract already was Stephen Kenny had left and went to Shamrock Rovers so I, I was you know and he was one of the main reasons I went up to Derry in the first place so um, I wasn't so sure where I was going to play the following year um, but start December, a guy on Facebook reached out to me, and it was just, "Hey, Eamon, um, saw you had a great season in Ireland. Um, would you be interested in, in playing away?" You know, a few messages later, he he said, "Look, I might have a, a proposal in in Iran for you." And um, initially, I, I was like, "I mean, Iran? Are you joking? Like, I mean, Iran?" Yeah. Uh, I, I genuinely. Obviously, I'd heard of Iran, but I actually had to obviously Google map it and find out exactly where it was and yeah. what countries are near it. But um, I didn't think I know, but I kind of just kind of just brushed it off. Um, and I went over to uh, Qatar. Libya were playing a little tournament with a couple of teams over in Qatar, in Doha. 
I played that, I was there for a couple of weeks, I flew back to Ireland just before Christmas and uh, the agent reached out to me again and he said, look, um, I'm serious, do you want to go to Iran? And he sent me over the, uh, he sent me over an actual written offer from, from the, the president of, of the team. Um, yeah. The team was obviously Paris Polis in Iran and uh, it was a, an invitation that said, Dear Mr. Zayed, on the back of your successful career in Ireland, finishing top goal scorer and player of the year, we would like to offer you a short-term six-month contract. Uh, and then there was the contract, um, or the, the terms of a contract. Yeah. And um, I'll be honest, like the terms of the contract were, were really good. I mean, I'm looking at the terms of the contract, going, I mean, if I went over there for five, six months, that's a deposit for a house. Um, you know, that, that could take years of a normal job to kind of to save and, and I can get that in six months um, and that was my initial thought um, when I looked at the terms of the contract um, but I was still thinking hold on I mean Iran so I got in touch with the there was a, an Irish embassy over in Iran at the time I rang them and um, that was my first call I rang them and they said look what's your you know do you have any fears about coming to Iran or what's your issues and um, I told them I, I just you know Iran was was a country of no, like it was like unknown. Nobody knew anything about yeah, Iran, um, except for what you read or hear in the news, which wasn't very pleasant towards Iran. Um, but they were they were they were lovely. Um, they really were. Um, and uh, there, was, there was two Irish people working in the embassy, small embassy, and they said, "Look, if no problem, you'll people are very friendly. Um, I mean, you'll you know you'll enjoy the football. Um, you'll have a good time, and um, yeah, you won't have any issues." So. Um, so I went over anyway um, I flew over uh, they put my mind at ease um, they really did um, and I the people in the embassy the people in the embassy okay. yeah they really did um, as, la- as soon as they said look you've nothing to worry about you'll be alright it's safe uh, and you'll enjoy the football I said okay um, I mean if they're saying it's safe I mean I trust them they're Irish I trust yeah. them um, so off I went um, just before Christmas signed the contract Flew back, Christmas, New Year's here in Ireland, and then I went over to Iran January 4th, 2012. Um, and to say... A bit of an interesting story to your debut, isn't it? Yeah, well, to say I had a... It was a bizarre start. Um, I mean, I, I, I went over January 4th. Let's say I know, a couple of days later I started training. So I rock up to the training ground, lovely training ground, lovely facilities, um, it's gated off, you have all the media and fans kind of waiting at the gate, um, you know, every single day, um, you'd, you'd go through through the gate, lovely pitch, little little, little kind of, I don't know, maybe 1,000 seater stadium, um, and then you have your, all the facilities that you, you could need for a professional football club right there, like with your, your weights, your gym room, your... Uh, kitchen your Everton like so um, it was great but um, anyway I rock up first day of training and um, the coach um, a Turkish coach must have been easily um, calls me over just like this so I kind of walk over to him I said hey hey I'm I'm Eamon Zayn I'm you know new player and he didn't look at me he turned around to a guy standing beside him who was his translator and he said uh, blah 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 whatever and the translator said uh, sorry who are you I said I'm Eamon Zayn I just signed for the team you know obviously I was yeah. bright and bubbly excited to start and um, I mean my excitement was didn't last very long because the uh, the translator said look what, what position do you play I said I'm a forward and he said look this is obviously true the coach speaking to the translator and um, he said uh, I didn't sign you the president of the team signed you he goes I don't even know who you are um, he said what I'll do is uh, I mean I'll I'll watch you in training for a couple of weeks and then I'll decide what I'm going to do with you um, I was like, okay. Um, I mean, that's Bizarre. that's yeah. It's not really the start that I wanted or a greeting that I was hoping for. So um, the whole month of January, I I trained away. Um, it was a tough month um, because no one spoke to me. Um, I mean, none of the players spoke to me. Um, coach, I mean, he might have talked to me once, if if that. Um, and through the translator um, yeah if, if that it was through the translator but I, I don't even know if he did talk to me I just kind of trained for the month um, stuck in a hotel um, throughout that month the team had I think five games or so um, I wasn't involved in any of them I wasn't in any of the squads um, so 
it was a, it was, it was not great. Um, it was a tough time, and it was, it was a lonely time. Um, I imagine it would be. It's, it's, it's very far away from Ireland as well. Ah, yeah. I mean, it's. I'm sure. Um, is it, what was the bit of time difference? Iran is ahead. Is ahead by a few hours. Um, three to four hours are ahead by. Oh, okay. Um, but um, yeah, it was just. It was. It was a tough time. It was. Um, when you go over to a new country or a new culture. You know, it was. I mean, it was everything was new about your hand. Everything. Um, you know, you you're hoping that you'll just you'll meet somebody, um, you know, that can speak good English and they'll show you around and all that kind of stuff. Um, and only for the Irish Embassy, actually, there was the two people. Um, the Irish Embassy was a small embassy of about five people or six people, um, but two of the uh, employers there were Irish. So they would invite me over to the embassy, and, and I became friends with them. And you know, they'd invite me over to the house for dinner or whatever. And uh, you know, only for them being there, I mean, I, I probably would have went insane, like you know. Yeah. Um. But um, look, a month, a month goes by, and uh, the coach rings the uh, president of the team, and he rings my agent, and he says, "Look, I've seen enough of this guy. I'm not going to use him." Um. And uh, <laughs> it was funny the. Uh, the president of the team then turned around to the coach and said, "Ah, oh, no, hold on here. Look, I've, I've brought him over here. Um, you're going to use him at least once. Um, you know, after that, we'll decide where we go from there. But, um, but I'm telling you, you're going to use him once. And when the president of, of 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 those teams over there speaks, you you listen. You listen. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have no choice, um, but to listen. So, um, so yeah. So that the the following game. Um, I was announced in the uh, 18 man squad um, and this was the, the derby game um, it was the big derby how do I people that don't know I guess I mean we we have, you have big derbies here in Ireland and you have bigger derbies Celtic, over in England Celtic and Rangers then you have a Celtic and Rangers um, and maybe it is similar I mean Celtic and Rangers in Glasgow maybe it's similar to that um, it's either it's either on the same level or it's bigger Um this is one of the biggest derbies in Asia, if not the biggest. Um, you know, you have a city of, I mean, Glasgow's. I don't know how many million are in Glasgow, but in in Tehran, it's a city of fifteen to twenty million people, and you're supporting one team or the other, um, and that's it. One team, the team I play for, wear red, and um, Palace, and um, the team we play against, the derby uh, rivals are Essegla, and they wear blue. And um, I mean, you support one team or the other. Um, football is is life over there. Um, yeah. You know, in 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 Glasgow, let's say, and, and other parts of the world, um, England and all that kind of stuff, where you have your derbies. Um, I mean, football's massive, of course it is. Don't get me wrong, but um, you know, a week later or whatever, a week before, you know, people are doing their are getting on with their lives. They're 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 hanging out with their mates. They're doing this, that, and the other. They're going to the bar. They're whatever they're doing. There's loads of other things to distract them. Whereas over in Iran, it's just a game. It's football. They have other things. Don't get me wrong, but. Mm. Not, not like what we have over here it's football and, and I mean there's a massive lead up to the game for weeks and then you know a game over there is uh, is bigger than win the league um, it really is if, you know they don't if they can win the derby and not win the league that's they're happy yeah you know if they lose the derby and win the league it's still a bit like ah but we lost the derby so um, I wasn't aware of this at, at the stage I re- at the time I I really wasn't aware of this. I just knew that there was a derby game. I knew that there was there was more media than usual at the training facilities. Um, there was a lot more attention, um, you know, with the lead up to the game. And I mean, I can read body language, and I could tell that the players on my team were were they looked tense and nervous um, for that week. Let's say anyway, leading up to the game, and um, I was just I was just happy to be named in the eighteen man squad, thinking right. I'm in the 18-man squad. I haven't kicked the ball yet for the team. The chances of me getting on in such a game are <laughs> probably slim. So uh, let's just enjoy it. And uh, and that was kind of my mindset um, from the hotel right into the stadium. You know, it was fantastic. Um, it's a fantastic scene. You know, it's a it's a five-minute, ten-minute bus journey from the hotel that takes you about 50 minutes because of all the fans on the uh, on the roads. See a blue, see a red. Um, colours on the way into the stadium you get to the stadium um, you just hear thumping of people just jumping up and down their seats and um, go out onto the pitch uh, stadium holds 100,000 people um, that game there was 86,000 people usually it's a sellout um, but 
that that night was probably the coldest night I've ever played football in. It was um, oh, it was extreme. So I admire the eighty six thousand people that showed up, but um, you know, I mean, prior to that game, obviously I had the living experience of fifty sixty thousand people at, at, at their games, which was great. So um, so that was that. But I mean, club football from from Derry City, Brandywell, two and a half, three thousand. To anywhere else, you know, in Ireland, Shamrock Rovers or at Turner's Cross down in Cork City, wherever. I mean, you're not getting more than a few thousand people at the games. So, um, just walking out onto the pitch, you know, to do the warm up, and yeah, you know, you. I mean, I'm just, I'm just constantly looking like this. I mean, it was just it was beautiful to see. <laughs> it really was. Um, I can imagine being like, like Pope Park and looking around like yeah. I wouldn't even be able to yeah, understand if that. If you're not used to it, it's uh, yeah. I mean, I wasn't used to it, so it was. Um, that was great, um, and I guess you can. There's certain. I mean, there's there's different types of feelings you can have. Some people will be like really nervous, and kind of go, "Oh my god, I'm mean, like playing in front of these." Yeah. They kind of tense up. Um, but you would thrive I was, on it more so. Really. Yeah, I was. I, I don't know. I just I just really enjoyed it. I was like, "This is absolutely great." I wish I could play. Um, so anyway, um, I'm on the bench. Game kicks off. Um, now we are playing. They're not only our rivals. They're first. They're they're top of the table, um, and they're hot favourites to win the league. We are kind of struggling in tenth position. Um, although we're the biggest team in Iran, um, we're we're kind of struggling. Um, at at the time we are struggling. Um, so anyway, game kicks off, and uh, as expected, they the Estegal went one 0 up, um, and uh, went into the. To the tra change room, half time, uh, one 0 down. Um, I remember I was uh, went into the change room, and uh, I remember I was just I was so cold. It was so, so cold. Um, I went and just got a cup of tea. Kind of sat in the corner with a cup of tea. Obviously, the the, the Turkish coach was given his half time team talk in whatever language. I mean, I, I didn't know what was going on. I was just uh, I was just sitting there. Trying to take it all, yeah. I was just do you know what I was just trying to I was trying to get warm, it was freezing, so I was just drinking my cup of tea, whatever. And uh, I mean it was a bizarre set of events. The the electricity went out in the whole stadium and in our changing room. Um and I, when it when the electricity went out, the coach continued speaking. Um and I remember not long after that the uh, the translator, Eamon, Eamon, Eamon and he's calling my name and I'm sitting there having a cup of tea in the corner and I'm like, what's, what's going on? And he goes, the coach wants you to warm up. I'm going, all right, geez, okay, okay, okay. So uh, I put on my boots and, um, you know, I have my boots on, of course I did. I just went out, right? I put down my cup of tea, went out. Uh, went <laughs> it out sounds so casual. Went out with the stadium. No, it was, I'm, I'm kind of a laid back guy, but um, I was like, okay, okay, okay. So anyway, I went on, um, put the put the tea down. I uh, don't think I finished it. Maybe I did. But anyway, I went on to the uh, to the pitch, and it was uh, oh, it was beautiful. The uh, I get like the electricity was out, so all you had was the whatever the eighty six thousand people with their phones phones out. You see that concerts every now and then. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, nice. yeah, and it was. I mean, that was the only thing lighting up the pitch. And I'm just jogging, you know, warming up for whatever five ten minutes, just kind of looking at this going, this is this is unbelievable. Um, anyway, look, the electricity eventually comes on. It wasn't a, 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 a massive long break, maybe an extra five, ten minutes, um, you know, then the usual 15 minutes break at half time. The electricity comes on, I continue my warm behind the goal, and um, I mean, five, ten minutes, we go another goal down, so we're two nil down. With um, well, maybe 30 minutes ago, um, 60 something minutes, um, I, get, I get a call from the coach, and. How many thoughts there coming on 2 0? Well, I'm jogging over to the coach, or well, running over to the coach, um, and I'm thinking, right, initially I'm thinking, oh my god, I'm coming on, a little bit nervous, right? Then, as I'm, you know, changing, getting out of my whatever, um, tracksuit and all, whatever I had on, um, I'm thinking, right, relax, Amy, you're tuning down here. I mean, you're, you're, you're going on with, I mean, what are the chances you're going to win or, or create some kind of comeback? Um, not great, because we're not playing well. We're 2-0 down. We're playing against the best team in the league at the moment. Um, yeah, so um, that was my thoughts. So I go onto the pitch. And, uh, I mean, I might have touched the ball a couple of times, um, you know, in the first couple of minutes, the first 10 minutes, let's say. And uh, then we we ended up getting a player sent off. Um, a little frustration, our left wing kicked out of one of their players. Straight red card. And he's marching off um, 70 odd minutes and um, 
I remember that was the time when he was what when he got the, when he got sent off. I remember looking at him kind of marching towards the dressing room. I remember thinking in my head, we're two 0 down, we're down to ten men. Right. Just relax at him. I mean enjoy it, because I mean you can't get any worse than this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, it can't get any worse. Um, and you weren't the one that got sent off, so you, I didn't, you yeah, wouldn't I, be blanked. Yeah. I didn't get sent off. I wasn't there when, when we were, you know, when we went to two 0 down. Um, I thought, right, just enjoy it. Um, so my whole demeanour was just really, really calm um, and composed. And um, and I think that led to, to the performance. I think um, five minutes later, um, 80, 80 minutes, um, I got a ball played through. Um, split beautiful ball, split the defence, and uh, I ran onto it. Keeper comes out and I finished it, and it was two one. And uh, I remember just thinking, right, come on, get the ball, let's go back, you know, two one. Um, and then two minutes later, um, don't even have time to think. Um, ball comes across, header um, onto the ground and, and into the goal. And um, I remember then thinking, oh my god, great! So I ran over to our fans. And uh, obviously we're all celebrating, and it's fantastic. The eighty-something minute, you know, we're we're back to two-two, and um, and I'm thinking, right, two-two, let's just keep it at two-two, and I'm a hero. Um, and I remember that's what I was thinking. So um, anyway, we, we we play on for another whatever. This is we're already in the eighty odd minute, but it goes into the ninetieth minute, and um, I remember we got a throw in right by our dugout, um, but it was in their half. And um, I remember the, the, the coach, um, obviously he doesn't speak Persian, the Turkish coach, he was trying to use his football language, use his arms, going, keep it in the corner, keep it in the corner. So I remember our, def our defender, um, our left back was taking a throw, I remember he kind of looks over, he's about to take it, he looks back at the coach, and he's, you can see it on the video, going, I'm thinking, like, well, what the fuck's he just said? I do not know what he just said. Yeah. Anyway, he continues, he throws it into our left winger, um, who, instead of holding it into the, in the corner flag, which... I mean, usually that's what you're told to do. He, he takes it past one player and just drills the ball in low to the front post. Um, and I'm in there by myself in the box. I think there's maybe three or four of Vestigal players in there. But luckily, I, I make a move and fall to my foot. I turn and, and, and yeah, without thinking, you just finish it. Until instinctive. It to the, yeah, it was, I was definitely instinctive. I mean, you had no time to think. Um, you just finish it low into the corner. And, um, ah, yeah, you just... Goosebumps run over to the crowd, our bench straight over to me in the opposite side of um, opposite side of them, and um, yeah, it was great. Um, you know, we won that game three two, and um, you become, I guess, a legend overnight. Um, you know, and um, it was only like after that game and, and the weeks and months um, and years, I guess, um, after that game that I kind of realised, Jesus, like that was. That was Kind of Royal Rover stuff, what happened there, yeah. you know, um, and everything changed for me after that. Um, everything changed for me. I, uh, the coach overnight learns how to speak fluent English, um, which was bizarre. He, he, he spoke That's crazy. Me. Yeah, he's, <laughs> I mean, the next day he calls me over and says, hey, Well done, and you know, how are you feeling? How's the legs? Are you tired? And I'm just going, Hold on, you speak English, um, you know, the players in the team, you know, you earn the respect. Um, when you go over to, to, to countries like that, um, or when you just go away um, to a different culture and, and definitely a country and they don't really speak English, I just feel sometimes they don't really make an effort. Um, you know, I don't know what it is. You know, they, they look at you, you're this foreign player coming in. Maybe you're looking, you're coming in to take their position. I don't know, yeah. but they do. They don't really say anything to you, and you're you're, you're you are left alone. But as soon as you prove yourself on the pitch. Um, I won't come up and talk to you, and you know, it turns out that a, a couple of them can actually speak a bit of English. Um, so um, it was, yeah, it was funny, but I uh, I played every game possible after that. That was fit for um, coach named me every t every game. And that was just for the six months then, was it? Initially, it was for six months, and uh, things went well, and uh, I signed another year. So I was in Iran for a year and a half. Okay, and yeah. then did it just come to an end, and then you went elsewhere, or how did that kind of? Yeah, um, yeah. What happened was um, Iran were Iran economically were finding it really, really tough. Um, there were there was I mean without going into it, but politically and 
there was a lot of sanctions against Iran at the time. Um, you know, how do I explain it in, in detail without kind of getting into it? Um, basically, America and the rest of the world, let's say, felt that uh, there was a lot of talk of Iran building nuclear weaponry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I know this is all over the news. And um, to, to prevent this this from going ahead, they, um, they they stopped all these funds going into Iran and out of Iran, and um, they made it really difficult. They prevented any bank outside of Iran to, to be allowed to deal with um, the Iran banks. So um, because of that, um, the Iran currency went from here to here. Um, so when you signed a contract over in Iran, let's hypothetically say uh, one dollar equals two of the okay. Ira uh, Iranian currency. Um, within, geez, just went like that, within four months, you know, one dollar equals eight of the Iran currency. So they found it really, really difficult to pay their foreign players. So um, I would go months without getting paid. And, um, and this continued and, and I had a few issues there with regards to getting paid um, and I just, you know, a year and a half I felt right, I've been here long enough, um, maybe it's time for, for a different journey. And I'll be honest, um, I don't know if i said this before but everything was telling me to sign for Sligo Rovers. Um, I met Ian Barclough who was a coach at the time, lovely guy, really nice guy and um, everything was telling me to sign for Sligo. They had a great squad at the time, um, you know, it's great players, Richie Rowan was there at the time, um, you know, amongst other players, but I felt, you know, I could, I could play in that team and score half of the goals, um, because they liked attacking football, um, and it kind of thought it suited me. Um, but I met Trevor Crawley and Shamrock Rovers, who was kind of more defence-minded, um, and the reason why I didn't go to Sligo was, um, was because my girlfriend who was a guard was based in Dublin and the reason why I wasn't going back to Iran or why I wasn't taking up any of the other offers that I had abroad was to be close to her so I said you know what no I'll stay in Dublin and, and, and I'll sign for Shamrock Rovers so I signed for Shamrock Rovers uh, under Trevor Crowley and um, and yeah I'll be honest um, it just didn't go well it really didn't um, Trevor Crowley I met Trevor Crowley before I signed and he painted a picture to me that uh, that I, I felt obviously when I got there it was kind of false. He, he, he told me that you know he had a team that created loads of chances and what he felt was missing was just basically like a Gary Remember Twig type striker. Yeah. Someone that could score goals. Um, you know, someone that would get in the get in the box and get on the end of those chances. And that's what I'm good at. That's definitely my strongest point. Um, so that's what he told me. Um, but when I saw him there, um, things were different. Um, firstly, instead of instead of kind of he signed me because he felt I could score goals and I could get in the end of chances. Um, but when I signed, he kept telling me about what I can't do and I need to work on what I can't do. And of course, as a coach, you want to. You're, you want to make your players better. But, um, and you want them to work on, let's say, the aspects of the game that they're not so good on. But you cannot forget why you brought them there. You brought yeah. them there because they're strong at, at this and that and the other. So focus on why you brought them there and what they're strong at. And then, yeah, in the touch meantime, maybe things. touch on what they can improve on. Um, but he was just, he was, um, he was just so focused on what you can't do and you need to get better at that you need to get better at that that you kind of forget what you're good at um, and you kind of then start focusing on your, your, your weaker points and try to make them better um, and it just kind of confuses you and takes away from your game um, and I also realised that he didn't want a, uh, he didn't want a number 9 that was you know focused on scoring goals and like a Gary Twig type striker Gary Twig would not would not have, a, have done well at Shamrock Rovers had Trevor Crowley been the coach there um, when he was there. He wouldn't have. Um, Trevor Crowley wanted a, 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 a striker who would just run channels, um, put himself about, um, and yeah, hold the ball up. And Great, if you can get on the end of chances whilst you're doing all that, do. But um, you, you can't 
you can't have a striker doing both um, really well. You usually have a striker who can score goals um, and you know poacher and all that kind of stuff, and you have someone playing beside him who's doing all that yeah. kind of work. Um, or else you you'd say you know what I have a striker and he's going to do all that, um, but he's not going to be able to score all those goals that I need. So then I have my right winger and my left winger um, yeah. coming in and scoring the goals. So putting in. Um, so you, did, you didn't stay that long there. No, no, no. And I'm not bashing Trevor Crowley because he's a he's a fantastic coach, um, and he's probably a fantastic assistant manager. But he's not a manager, and I think he's probably realised that now. Um, I think he's he's in a he's assistant now at Bohemians, yeah. um, and and they done really well last year. Um, I yeah, I didn't I didn't really have a a, a great time um, at Shamrock Rovers, um, and uh, I felt I got a bit of a I don't know well whether it was deserved or undeserved. Um, I felt I got a bit of a harsh time from the fans. They never really talked to me, um, maybe because I played against them so many times and I had a few. There's a couple of disagreements um, without getting into it racially, let's say, with them. Okay. Um, but um, no, I, re- I remember probably the, the. I remember what sticks out in my head was um, I remember I was on the bench, Shamrock Rovers were playing, could have been. Who was that? Could have been at long. I can't remember. Um, but we were playing a league game, it might have been at long because they weren't in a league, but we were playing, we were playing a game at home. And uh, I was on the bench, and uh, it was nil all. After sixty odd minutes, I get the call to come on. I come on, and I think within five ten minutes, the ball's played over the top, uh, and on the right side, and I'm about twenty five thirty yards out on the volley of ping one in top corner. Right, it was probably I don't score many goals from outside the box, so. I was happy with this one. Um, it was probably one of the, one of the sweetest strikes <laughs> uh, I've ever scored. Um, but you I knew once I left your foot. Yeah, I, as soon as I left my foot, I was like, "Ah, oh, yeah, right." I was in one nil, right? We uh, they tip off, and the ball goes back to the, the midfielder, back to the left back, right? Now I chase it here, I chase it to the left back, the ball but back to the centre back, I chase it to the left back, then it's played back to the left back, and uh, and I chase the left back, and he hits it up, and when he hits it up the field have a massive section of the fans or well dirt there's a, there's, there's a section of the fans going like so you lazy fucker and I'm thinking fuck me like I mean I just come on scored a fucking great goal and straight away you're giving me abuse yeah. so um, I mean that, that sticks out in my head um, I just look so you weren't long staying around then it wasn't long with Shamrock Rovers uh, a year uh, I signed a year and a half deal but it didn't work out um, and after a year they allowed me to go to Sligo on loan and uh, it was funny um, again I went a year later uh, or a year too late um, I went but I had, a, I had a great time in Sligo I was only there for uh, for whatever second half of the season uh, John Coleman was the coach and um, I really enjoyed it um, really enjoyed my football there um, a lot of you may know um, I was playing playing up we played three up top and Shoney Maguire was up there actually at the time. Um it would be me, Shoney Maguire and um and, and someone else playing it, you know, three up top. Um and it was great. Um I think I scored six and eleven games and um yeah, I was enjoying I loved my time up there. Um but when I finished my contract there I had an offer um to to go over to Malaysia and play there. And uh and, and yeah, I, I decided to you know, why not travel over to Malaysia and, and you know see what football is like over there? Again, a complete different culture. Um, uh, you know, and the opportunity to go and travel in Asia a little bit as well whilst I was there. So um, that's what I done, and uh, I had a good time in Malaysia. Um, I did. I was there for the year, um, and uh, it was it was good. I I played and uh, played in a team with El Has Juf. Okay. Which uh, not not very well liked in Ireland. I don't think the Celtic fans and stuff. He's not very well liked anywhere. Um, uh, yeah, 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 except for Senegal, probably. Um, Bolton, maybe is it? He uh, ah, he's a bizarre character. Um, he really is. Um, in terms of uh, on the pitch, um, in terms of on the pitch, it was great. I mean, I had grown up. Uh, you know, I watched him play for Senegal in in two thousand and two World Cup. Two yeah. World Cup, and he was on yeah, France, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, he was on flames in that tournament. Then I see, you know, obviously going to Liverpool and, you know, 
uh, Bolton and Blackburn and Stinton Rangers um, Leeds. and Leeds um, so obviously you know he was someone that I kind of I saw playing um, playing on TV so uh, it was nice to play with him um, and it was great we played a 4-4-1-1 he was the number 10 I was the number 9 and um, the guy was a genius with the ball now fair enough it was the Malaysian League and the standard was wasn't great um, but it was it was because it wasn't so great it actually made playing in the league kind of more difficult because you were playing with guys that you know you'd run front post and they'd ping the ball maybe back post or maybe even able to play um, I mean, you know you'd look for the ball at the feet and they'd just ping the ball at your face um, so uh, so you really relied on the farm players that were within your team and yeah. every team was out of four farm players but um, it was great you know give the ball to El Hashjuf because we were told the coach would just tell everyone get the ball to him so he'd get the ball and as soon as he got the ball uh, I mean he had the ability to skip by players or just take a touch and kind of look up and you just made any kind of run pinpoint on your foot um, and it was great I think I scored 11 goals in 21 games over there and um, he definitely definitely assisted 6 or 7 of them um, so it was uh, it was great to play with him um, off the pitch he was a lunatic um, again I, you know I probably won't I'm not going to go into it yeah. um, but um, yeah uh, he's, he's he's a madman um, so that was yeah I have loads of stories to tell which if ever I uh, if ever I bring out a book I'll, I'll tell them but um yeah, no, he's. I can only imagine. Ah, uh, he was crazy, but um, it was great. Yeah, so a year in Malaysia. So, so yeah, so for Malaysia, um, I went over to America. I got a an offer to play over in America, which was really intriguing. I mean, America was. I'm not gonna be. I'm not gonna be like Robbie Keane and say it was my dream to always play for this club or that club. Um, but I definitely, definitely, always. I think it's a dream for a lot of people just to go and live there, even for yeah. a while. I was always intrigued by America, and I always um. There was a uh, years before that I had a couple of opportunities to go over there, um, and I didn't. Um, I was in Iran at the stage, and then I decided to stay here in Ireland when I came back from Iran. So I turned down a couple of opportunities, but um, it was definitely somewhere that I always wanted to go and play, uh, and you know, and see. So um, so when the offer came, again, you know, right, kind of just perfect timing for it. Um, you know, to come back from Malaysia, I wasn't so sure what I was going to do and where I was going to play. Um, and then America came calling, and as soon as they came calling, I was like, oh, "That's it, I'm doing this, I'm going." So, uh, yeah, I flew over there in um, the beginning of 2016, and um, yeah, we're in the 11 uh, over in Indiana, which is the Midwest, as they call it in America. Um, lovely place, um, really nice place. People are really, really friendly. It was so easy to settle in. I mean. It was great because I had gone from, you know, trying to settle in in Iran was difficult. Um, trying to settle in Malaysia was was difficult. Just, you know, you, you settle in, but it takes time. Yeah. Um, you know, and because these, you know, obviously they don't speak their language, all that kind of stuff. It's a different culture. America's, I mean, it's, it's different, but similar They're to They're a lot more open. I do know. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I've lived there. They are very open. If you're... In any way, open or friendly, they will be too. Yeah, I think they pick up on it. Yeah, especially in the Midwest, and um, and they're you know especially when they hear the Irish accent coming on. Yeah, they want to know, oh, hey Jay, you know where are you from and all this, and I love Ireland and all that kind of stuff. And I look, tell you about their great relatives. Oh ah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're all they're all part of Irish somehow. Yeah, but um, I ah, look, it was so easy to settle in, and um, I loved it from day one. I loved it, and um, I'm a big believer in if you're happy off the pitch you will play well on the pitch. Um, I really am. Um, and it's definitely the case with me. So, uh, you know, off the pitch, I loved it. Um, settling in was easy. And um, and that that made uh, made for a great season. Um, the 2016 season um, was Indies. I mean, they've only been in existence five years, but that was that was their best season to date. Um, we had a really successful season. We won a spring championship, um, which was... Which was uh, which was a spe- it was special for everyone involved, but um, for me it was it was really really special um, because uh, the way it works in America is they split the season into they have a spring season, a fall season, and then the winners of each season and the runners up go into a playoff yeah. situation, and then you go into your final championship game. 
Um, going into our last um, game of the spring championship, we had a chance to win it, but we had to win by three goals. And um, no one gave us a chance. They really didn't. It was uh, New York Cosmos were, 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 were winning the league at the, at the stage. And um, if, if we, we had to win by three goals. And if we didn't, New York Cosmos won the league, or won the spring championship. So um, going into the game, we I think our, our I think we had scored two goals. I think two goals was the most we had scored in the game prior to that. Um, but we needed to win by three. So and we were playing against North Carolina, which I mean they they were a good team. So um, I mean no one really gave us a chance of of winning by three goals. But um, it was great. Um, I uh, I managed to uh, to score a hat trick in the game, and they scored. We were three one up, and the eighty six minute I scored to make a four one. And uh, and and the finish for one, and obviously we, we won by three goals. And you seem to have a uh, habit of scoring important hat tricks. Huh? It was yeah, I, yeah. I mean, yeah, I've been blessed in, in certain situations. So um, fans swarmed the pitch, and uh, it was great. It was nice to have the. It was nice to be part of history within the club and have the first, um, you know, first first trophy, title, uh, yeah. first trophy to go in the in the cabinet. So that season was great. Um, we managed to to get to the playoff final. Um, we played New York Cosmos and we actually lost on penalties. Um, but it was overall it was a great season. I I got into the NESL team of the year. I um, I think the in the eleven the record in, in a goal goal scored in the season was eight. Um, I don't remember Cleverson who played. Yeah, yeah, in, yeah, for United yeah. And Brazil. He had played for the, Yeah, he had played for Indy eleven a couple of years before that and, and scored eight in, in there in his first season there, and that was top goal scorer at the time so um, I got 16 that season um, which far surpassed that and it was great uh, it was a fantastic start to, to my time in America um, I stayed on with Indy 11 I signed a two year, fresh two year contract at the end of 2016 and uh, and yeah so season just gone by it, it was it's been a little bit more difficult um, in terms of how the team have done um, we had a few issues throughout the year um, few injuries to key players and I don't want to make excuses but we didn't do as well as we were expected um, individually I think I think I've, I felt I've done alright um, I think we finished 6th in the league um, but individually I finished 2nd uh, half goal scorer within the league which uh, which I felt was respectable um, yeah definitely and um, and now I'm looking forward to, to starting the uh, 2018 season yeah. Now you have. You, I just seen there on your Instagram. You have your your wife a B license, hmm. and then you were saying that you uh, was it a website you're looking at doing it. So I yeah I I finished my UA for B. I um I got my certificate. I found out I passed it there in Osolando uh, a couple of weeks ago actually. So um no coaching is something that I want to um I want to keep. I enjoy doing. Um I really I've I've been coaching there the last year or so in America and really loved it, and uh, I want to continue doing that. Um, I'll probably start my A license um, as soon as possible, um, and it's something that I can see myself getting into. Um, you know, I want to play football for as long as I can. Uh, in the meantime, I want to get some experience, some real proper coaching experience. And who knows? I, mean, I think most players now are doing that too. Yeah. Anyway, so, yeah. I think it's. Uh, I think it's. It's de- in America, especially. It's. It's there's a pathway there for for a good career if you want to get into coaching. Um, yeah. And if. We had Stephen Beattie in on the couch a few weeks ago for Cork, and he was saying the exact same thing. Yeah, it's um, and I I don't know I, I feel like I have a lot to I feel I've a lot to give. I've from from my experiences as as a youngster trying to break over to England, coming back, um, trying to reinvent yourself and, and making a career of it here in Ireland, um, you know, then obviously with the international football in Libya, and then going over to experience different things in in Iran and Malaysia and now America, um. I don't know. I just feel like I've you pass on your knowledge. Even I feel like I've a lot. Yeah, I feel like I've have a lot to give, and um, I've learned a lot, and I've worked under some unbelievable coaches um, of top top caliber. So um, and I've picked at their brains and, and, and learned little bits from them. So um, I'm going to continue that and see where that takes me. Um, yeah, I have. I've I've struck up a bit of a Instagram following, um, which is just came out of nowhere. Um, you know, February 2016, I joined Instagram and uh, it just grew and grew and I've 359,000 followers now on Instagram um, Eamon's I12 <laughs> Eamon's I12 if anyone wants to follow me um, we'll put it we'll put yeah, it in the link but, uh, <laughs> but no um, no and, and through that I've been I've, I've 
few um, companies and brands have reached out and asked me to do this and that for them, um, which uh, which is interesting. So um, as soon as you get that open, more or less, now we'll yeah, I'm gonna. It. You know, I want to. I, I want to start a blog. I, I love writing. I've always enjoyed writing, and I've done a little bit for for Extra Time and, and a couple of other little bits for newspapers, and I've done a little bit for the Indie Eleven website last year as well. So I'm gonna um, set up. Um, I have my URL link, aimandside.com, but I want to. Uh, I'm gonna get that up and running over the next few weeks. Um, just you know, I have weekly blogs and um, just telling my adventures and my experiences, and uh, and that should be up and running soon. All right. Well, um, I won't keep any longer because I've been here. Uh, longer than expected. Thanks very much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. I uh, we'll I definitely hope. have you back on again. You now uh, maybe you'll have your late a license on your website up and running about that That's stage. It's a plan. I hope I haven't bored many of you uh, too much. Oh um, no, not at all. Very interesting. Uh, guys, if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Uh, thanks very much for watching. Um, also, uh, don't forget to give it a subscribe. Thank you very much for watching Irish Football Fan TV.